Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's lovely to see this turnout. For folks who are listening later on the video, there's 35 centimeters of snow forecast for this evening. <laughs> so we all feel quite heroic for having made it here. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad to see you all. And I want to thank Janine and the other volunteers who made this possible. It's, um, it's really been great to be doing these lectures and I've enjoyed it a lot. This is the third in a series, and the lectures are a kind of theoretical background that matches the experiential work we do in the Community Healers Council. So some folks here will be members of the Healers Council. Let's just see who's, who's a current or past member of the Healers Council. There you go. Okay, so lots of that. And then other folks you may be curious or just interested in the subject in general. So just to give a little bit about the Healers Council, it's a monthly gathering and we meet in three-month semesters. It's a day-long event, and we're really exploring the question that comes from a teacher of mine, which is, how do we become the ones the spirits trust to carry the healing into the future? So that's a big question. We've got a lot of exploring to do in that department. And another way to think about it is it's like a, almost a contemporary medicine society. What would it be for folks like me, white, western descended settlers in this land, how do we come together and explore what it is to be healers in this space and in this place? So the next semester starts in April, and there's lots of information in the back if you're interested. So the question we ask in the Healers Council and what we're talking about here is really, what would healing look like if we imagined and we lived in a world that was bigger than the Western mind allowed it to be. We have a very particular lens on things and it only shows us certain things. And if we have a bigger lens, what could we see? So we're working from the principle that healing is about wholeness. And etymologically, healing and wholeness and holy are connected. So that's a kind of theme to hold as we address this question over the series. And there's a couple of important points to make, which is that we're not the first people to do this. And to that, I, I refer people back to the previous video in this series, which is about the shamanic archetype. And it's a big exploration of what it is to look at healing from that holistic way, engaged with a living world full of visible and invisible beings. And that this is a natural capacity and a natural inclination in human culture. So that, that video answers a lot more questions about that. And tonight I want to talk sort of about three things. I'm going to talk about worldviews and how they frame our experience and to talk particularly about animism as a worldview that I think is really useful in exploring these questions and a little bit about, you might call it a transpersonal or a quantum or a non-dual worldview as well, but it'll be primarily an animist perspective. And then to really explore the idea that there are, there are some things that can only be seen through the lens of a certain worldview. And that if we, if we can adopt an animist worldview, different things become possible in terms of healing and learning and transformation. And then finally, to bring it back to how this relates to the Healers Council. So worldviews. Worldviews are the lenses we experience our lives through. And they're, they're so core to who we are that we don't notice them most of the time. It's like the water the fish swims in. It doesn't know it's in water, it just is. And there are lots of synonyms for what a worldview could be. You could call it a paradigm, a lens. You could call it the, the working narrative, the, the meta story, the myth. People even use the word consciousness. So when we talk about the myth of progress, we're not saying it's, a, it's an untrue story. We're saying that's a, that's a narrative, that's a story that guides something. And when we talk about lens, it's really shorthand. It's, it's what we, how we see things, but it's also how we experience in every sense, not just sight, the whole thing. So we might talk about consciousness, Western consciousness, the Western worldview, even mind. 
Western mind because we have to have a very mind-based worldview. And um, one of the important writers in the world of animism, Graham Harvey, talks about animism not as a worldview but as a life way because these worldviews are embodied. They're not abstract. They're enacted. And it's what we mean when we say something is culturally determined. It's, for these people, it happens this way. For these people, it happens that way. And worldviews are really designed to give us the tools and the capacity to navigate life. There's a lot going on. We need to make sense of this enormous world and find a way to interpret and make meaning of the things that happen and the things that exist. And worldviews can be, like maps, more or less accurate and more or less effective. So if, if it's a really accurate or effective or fitting to the territory worldview, then it supports life and it works and we can live our lives and thrive and survive and be sustainable. And I'm not the only one to see this, but scientific materialism as the kind of working worldview is not all that effective at that. We're not really doing a really good job of nourishing and supporting life. But an animist, more transpersonal worldview, and I'll talk about what those means, is a better map of the world. And one of the images and ways to think about this is if you imagine a body of water with islands in it. So there's water and then there are these islands that stick up. And a Western worldview might say, well, this is one island, and this is another, and this is another. And that's true at some level, but underneath, those islands are all connected. So a more holistic worldview says, well, yes, this is true, but it's not sufficient. It's not the whole story. It's not wrong. It's just not everything. And different worldviews make different interpretations possible. And they allow us to find different meanings. So, you know, it's like operating in base 10 or base 6 math. There are a different set of rules about how things happen. And you can't do a calculation here using these rules. Newtonian and quantum physics would be the same thing. And it, it applies in our daily lives. If you're speaking with someone who's on the very far end of a political spectrum from you, you probably have an entirely different set of assumptions about what the world is, what things mean, what things are caused by. And it's hard to find a connection because you're operating from such different perspectives. It's like a language. You know, if, if I'm an English speaker and someone speaks Swahili to me, I don't have the code to figure out what that is. And they're how we make sense of our world. So when we say something's true or real or not true or unreal, that has to do with where that worldview puts the line. It's between what is a thing and what isn't a thing. So those things are not always, but very often, not about an objective truth, but a function of the lens you're looking through. And if you're a researcher, if you're someone who's asking questions about the world, it's important to know what lens you're looking through because it tells you what, what's possible to be seen. I was at an event and I met this lovely high school student who's a Somali immigrant and she taught me a great word and it's a phrase, it's called code switching. So she moved here when she was four. And she lives in a deeply Somali community. Her family's Somali. She speaks that language. That's her culture. But she also grew up entirely in this world. And so she talks about code switching. She lives in that world, and she lives in this world. And that's, that's an expanded capacity because she can do both those things. So animism is, is a really quite a different code. We have to actually step into another mindset to be able to um, recognize it. And things that make sense in this mindset won't make sense in that. So we're going to compare animism to a Western worldview. And that's what I would guess most of us have grown up in in this world, in this room. And it's Western European. We can, you know, it's now spread. It's, it exists in lots of places and in lots of different people, but that was at roots. 
sort of the latter end of the Greeks, the 17th century Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution. You can look at back at that history. And it's, I think it's important to identify that it is a particular slant. It's not the norm, it's not the truth, it's just a particular slant, a particular lens that has a lot of power and has a lot of people using it, but it's not an objective truth. It's a little bit like the way it's important to identify that whiteness is a thing. It's not just normal, it's not the status quo, it's a particular version. So the Western worldview has lots of assumptions about how things work. It talks about what the world's made up of. Well, it's, it's three-dimensional reality. It's, you know, we think about maps that are made of grids. Very different, say, than uh, an indigenous drawn map, which wouldn't be gridded. So we, we say it's, everything can be mapped on that grid. And even time has a kind of grid where the past is behind us, the future's in front of us, we can never touch them, and we're right here. So time is very linear, travels in one direction only. Also says the world is, uh, is made of material. That's what it is. We're a materialist perspective. And that things are, uh, are what's real, rather than, say, the relationships between things. So we look at objects and that the world is full of objects than that we measure and quantify. So Newton's the classic. He sat of the tree, the apple fell on his head. That's, that's an object hits an object. That, was, that established that whole pattern of physics. Newtonian physics. Quantum physics says, oh, it's more complex than that. There are fields of energy and there are patterns and patterns of energy and even material objects are actually energy inside themselves. So it's a, a different frame. And all else being equal, uh, a child who grew up speaking English and a child who grew up speaking Navajo, the child who grew up speaking Navajo could understand quantum physics much more easily than the English speaker because built into the language are way more verbs. English is a very noun-based language. Things, things, things. Billiard balls, kind of. Navajo is a very verb-based and nouns are constantly being modified by how they are in relationship to others. So those are two different frames that allow us to see different things. And in the Western worldview, and this will be relevant because we think about what it is in the animist worldview, in the Western worldview, we, we, if we ask, what is a person? And so in this world of physical objects, some of them are people. Not all of them, and some of them. And that, that line's a little bit fuzzy because we don't always necessarily treat all human people as full people. There's been a lot of history of putting the line between which cultures were and how big your head is and where you fit in that. So even people can be objectified, but there are objects and there are some which are people. And we, we marginalize even human people, but we certainly marginalize and push from the center other things. And we also have a perspective that's very individualist, that we stop at the edges of our body and, and that we are our bodies and we can't really have an experience without our bodies. And so that's, that's given as a truth in this worldview. And worldviews all have values, like the point that they move towards. What, what's, the, what's the main object and what's the value? And I would say in a Western worldview, the value that, that we hold the dearest is personal health and well-being. How, how do I keep myself and those I care about healthy and sustained? That that's, that's what it's about. And you can translate that a little bit cynically to he who dies with the most toys wins. That's, that's a version of that. But it's about me getting stuff and me making sure I have enough stuff and the people I care about have enough stuff and we're okay. Now that can happen at the expense of others, human and otherwise. And when we look through a Western lens, we see the world as finite, as material, so we're all in competition for the same things. And it's not that everybody believes that, but it's that that's the, 
the public truth. That's the official sort of frame that all the major institutions operate from, even though we have private truths within that. And it, it's hard to overstate how important these are and how they guide what we do. And so that, that worldview, as I say, it's, it's not incorrect. It's just not sufficient. And it allows us to do lots of things. It allows us to build big buildings and fly around the world and, and create all the material wealth and comfort that we've been able to create. But it doesn't, it doesn't have a way to compute for love or for relationships or for kindness. Those don't fit in that framework. And it's, it's about, at its core, separation and accumulation. And it, it doesn't really offer a useful map for healing if we take the framework of healing to be around wholeness and the holy. It doesn't bring us peace in my work. It doesn't help us meet death and dying from a soul-based perspective. It helps us do it from a physical, but we miss a lot of the soul. So it gets us somewhere, but it doesn't get us everywhere. And the the difference between that public and private truth is really evident. You know, I, um, I end up being interviewed a lot, and I think about how the media, generally mainstream media, is pretty close to that public truth. And so when I'm interviewed, I talk about the fact that part of my work is supporting people after they've died, that my clients are the living, the dying, and the dead. And, you know, I can talk about that. I don't think I sound too batty, but... Every time that is edited out, I cannot, for the life of me, get that information in an interview. It's just silenced. And so there are so many different ways what we experience privately is different than what's, what's met in the hospitals and the medical system and the media and what's taught in university institutions. It's the public truth. So let's compare that a bit with animism. So animism is an alternative worldview, an alternative life way. And the word anima and animus are the masculine and feminine, the root of the word. And it means consciousness, breath, life, soul. It's, it's, it's animate. It's alive. Something is animate. And there's a history of this world. In the mid-1800s, it was coined by an anthropologist who was using it to describe, quote unquote, primitive tribes, you know, in, in, the, in the idea, developmental trajectory that says they're pre-modern, pre-literate, primitive. They just haven't evolved to be the same as us yet. And he used it to describe the kind of childish way he understood how they saw the world. Because children tend to see the world as alive. So one of the ways to describe sort of a catch phrase for that old animism would be it describes people who are unable to differentiate things from people. Okay? So they, they thought everything was a person, and it was used in a pejorative way. Starting in about the 60s with another anthropologist named uh, Irving Hollowell who did some work with the Ojibwes, he coined a whole new version of animism, which actually said, no, this is its own legitimate worldview. It's not developmentally before ours, it's just its own, and really reclaimed that. And his classic definition or classic line about animism is that animists are humans who recognize that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are humans. So there are many different kinds of persons or people in the world. Humans are one, but there are lots of others. So if you're interested in this work, Hollowell is sort of the grandfather of this wave of it. Graham Harvey is a more recent writer who's got two really great books out. One's called Animism, and then one is a, a reader on animism. Um, David Abram has A Spell of the Sensuous and Being Human, also really great books. And then uh, another one that's just come out recently is by a woman named Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass, and she's a Na Native American environmental science professor. So there's lots of new conversation about this. So animists are humans who believe that the world is made up of persons, only some of whom are humans. 
So the counterpoint to that statement from a Western perspective might be Westerners are people who believe the world is made up of objects, only some of whom are people. <laughs> and that really changes everything. <laughs> you're either an object or you're a person. An object, and in our language, very clearly, you're an object or a subject. Subjects act on objects. Subjects have agency, subjects have volition. Objects are passive and acted upon. So Martin Buber talks about the difference between an I-it relationship and an I-thou relationship. Changes everything. So from a relationship of utility to one of kinship. And that's at the core of animism. And there are many, many kinds of animisms, but that is a pretty universal statement that can be applied to all of them. And really what they're all about is putting nature and culture back together. That culture is not just the realm of the human. Culture exists in every realm, and culture and nature are indivisible. And animism is the public truth in many cultures. In many, indeed, most, I would say, indigenous and land-based and tribal cultures, also Asian cultures, even older European cultures, and it's the private truth of many of us. And it, for me, it's always a, a bit of a mind game to imagine what it would be like to really live in a culture where that was the public truth, where everything matched what my inner experience is. And that, that's a, a fantasy to explore a little bit. What is that like? Because it's, it's possible and it happens in lots of places. So persons. Hollowell coined this term called other than human persons. Not non-human, because that says human is the privileged class and non-human is always in relationship to being human, but other than human. So there are rock persons and there are tree persons and there are cloud persons. And human persons, human people tend to relate more with hum other human people, but deer people tend to relate more with other deer people. And deer people might think about other than deer people. It really flattens it out quite a lot, that we're just one, no different, no more, no less. So who can be a person? And that's a big question, and that's what a lot of animism is about exploring and trying to ask and answer. So a person can be any any visible or invisible being across any dimension. So trees and rocks and squirrels, clouds, lightning, weather beings, the sun, entities we experience in our dreams. When uh, Hollowell did his research, he talked about the Jibwe having an understanding of different species of animals having a master or a boss or an owner. So that when you went bear hunting, you made a connection with the boss of the bears. And that would determine, that relationship would determine how successful your hunt was, how the boss mm, smiled upon you. So there are also immortal beings of all sorts, unseen beings, fairies, leprechauns, gnomes, little folk, I mean, everything you can think of. But also tools, stories, songs, and then larger forces like luck, and memory and the future, so that all of those have personhood. And different cultures define personhood in different ways, and discerning is really what makes an animist. But the criteria is not physiology. It's not, it's not having a body, that's not required, and it doesn't, your body doesn't have to be a particular shape. But it's about behavior and about qualities. And the quality, the primary quality, is this enduring inner life force. And that persons, people, have an awareness of themselves and they a consciousness and an understanding of situations and dynamics. They have personal identity, volition, autonomy. They have likes and dislikes, preferences and needs and they can be pleased or displeased. But most importantly, they can be related with. They can be communicated with. That's what determines a person. And this inner soul force can, 
exists independent of bodies, and in fact, the outer bodies can change, that they're not required to be the same. So we can, we can be in a body, we can be out of body, we're still a person. So those are the qualities. Then what's the behavior? So people are people because they behave like people. And um, Graham Harvey says, persons are objects who are animated and social towards others. So it's a, it's a relationship, and you can't know necessarily if something or somebody is a person until you meet it, until you explore and engage. And is this a relationship of, of reciprocal awareness and communication? In many indigenous languages, person is a verb, not a noun. So it's something you do. Humans person, trees person, rocks person, it's an action. Weather patterns, goddesses, all of it, they person. And persons relate to other persons. So Harvey says, they're objects who are animated and social towards each other, but they may not always be sociable. So it doesn't necessarily mean easy relationships. So some of those other persons are hostile or wounded or nasty. And, but animosity and violence, even you know, killing, a predator-prey relationship. Those are still ways of being in relationship. And so because they're not all sociable, it's even more important to treat everything with respect and to move cautiously because the world is inhabited by an infinite number of beings and we want to be in right relationship with them. So not everything persons. And that can change over time. And sometimes things turn out to be persons. And I read a, an excerpt somewhere and this man was talking to a, an old indigenous elder and they were looking at a forest and the white researcher said to the elder, he said, well, which of those trees are people? And the elder looked at him like, don't you know anything? He said, they're the ones who are looking back at us. <laughs> That's how you tell. Are they looking at us or not? They're a person. <laughs> so, Practice putting your brain in that kind of space where that's how you walk through the world. So being an animist is about discerning over and over again who is a person and what is the proper relationship between that person and me. So heartbeats are not relevant. There's no differentiation between natural and supernatural. It just all is. And we, we have a, a much wider community of persons to whom we, we owe responsibility or we connect. So in this world of persons, there are no um, impersonal forces. So everything happens because a person caused it. And the reason they do or don't do something has to do with their relationship and the balance of how they are in the system. The, it happens in human systems, it happens in all systems. So the Huichol tribe in Mexico, they understand that the sun is a being, and every morning it chooses to rise. And it might not rise every day. It chooses to rise every day, but it doesn't necessarily rise every day. But every year, and they have for millennia, they make a pilgrimage to the sacred mountain, and they gather peyote, and they do their rituals, and that ritual is what encourages the sun to rise. So nothing happens just because. There's no impersonal forces. It's all because somebody somewhere is facilitating them. So the bear hunt is because the boss of the bear gives you the bears. You know, North America exists because Turtle went down to the bottom of the ocean and brought up the mud because Turtle wanted to create the island. Um, I've studied a lot with a teacher named Maladoma Somme, who's a West African healer and teacher, and he talks about in one of his books his um, brother being ill, his younger brother as a child, and it, the diagnosis was that his illness was caused because his uncle, who was supposed to tend the shrine for the water spirits, hadn't tended the shrine, and the water spirits were out of balance, and hence the nephew was ill. So illnesses are caused by persons who are out of balance and then act from that out of balance place. And what brings health and wellness is 
bringing all of that into balance, making sure the entire community of all the persons is in right relationship with itself. And so this, this way of being is, is developmental in a way. It's, it's, it's not innate. We don't come in knowing it. It's trained. It's the worldview we are acculturated to. And children come in more naturally that way. They understand things to be alive. Stuffed animals, animals in storybooks, cartoons. They have to be taught that the cartoon on TV is not a real thing and this is. So they have to be taught what the, what the line between real and not real is because everything for them is real. And so this sense of seeing the world as, as full of people, it needs to be in a way kind of nurtured or repressed. And David Abram talks a lot about this as a, as a somatic experience in the world, that if we actually trust our body's experiences, that's how we engage. We know when, when we are watching the waterfall or watching the birds or in the forest, our bodies know there is a connection. But we have to have that trained out of us in a way. And we, we need to... We have our senses carved down so they're only the five, when in fact we have a lot more senses. And this deepening relationship is, it's a learned skill, it's cultivated. And we are taught it, so we come in with it, but then it needs to be cultivated. So people become more animist, they become better at maintaining relationships, they learn more about other persons, they learn more about how to be in right relationship as they go through life. And to me that's encouraging because indigenous children are taught it, so maybe we can learn it. It's, it's not something, it'll be easier to learn in an intact culture that practices it, but it's not impossible. And that's why elders are so valued, because they've been around so long, they know so much about relationship. They've, they've accumulated a whole history of understanding what it is to be in this practice. And that's elders of any type of person, rock elders, tree elders, any kind of elder, and they're worthy of respect. Which, going back to he who dies with the most toys wins, is a very different understanding of what it is to be successful in life. That our goal in Western culture, but in an animist culture, the goal is to develop these relationships. And ancestors, ancestors, or ancestors being those we know and love who've died before us, are even more that way. And the fact that they don't have a body doesn't really make any difference. They're wiser because they've had more time and we can still connect with them and their wisdom. So in, in an animist culture, everybody is connecting that way, but there are some people who are really specialists at it. And these would be, if we use the terms from the other lecture, the shamans, right? The shamanic archetype. When Abrams talks about them, he talks about them as the wizards. In every culture, there are people who have that capacity. And that's the capacity to really code switch, to really be able to understand what the land is saying, what the eagle spirits are saying, what the ancestors are saying, what the future beings are saying. And that shamanistic healing approach is about being able to tune into all these, communicate with them better and more than most of the normal people in the culture can, and to learn what gestures will maintain that balance. So registering that, oh, the little boy is sick because the water shrine wasn't tended. That's having a, a broader language for that. So they're about more cultivated perceptual skills to be able to maintain these relationships. And really acting as intermediaries between human people and all the other people. Natural, supernatural, they all fall into the same category. So that's an animist perspective, where the world is seen as full of beings who are engaged with each other. So that, that has a big influence on the work we do in the Healers' Council. And then the other worldview that, that influences it a lot is the transpersonal. And so we could call it transpersonal or quantum or participatory or non-dual, a whole bunch of kind of technical names for an alternative to the Western worldview that, and we'll talk about what it, what it involves, 
it's not a complete overlap with animism, but there are lots of ways that they overlap. Animism is so much more focused on relationship, and that aspect of personhood is the core. But some of these other criteria sort of allow that. So these worldviews, they, they deserve a lot bigger conversation, but just to sort of name some parts of them. That they understand that there's an energetic reality that's parallel to the physical reality. So you could say there's this world and the other. There's Newtonian and there's quantum. Then that these two are, are almost like different tunings on the radio dial. They're just a breath away. It's just how you configure yourself to see which one's available. And they understand that time and space are malleable, that the past and the future can be accessed from the present, and that there's, there's no linearity or limitation in that. And the same with space, that it's, it's not fixed in a three-dimensional grid. There's, a, there's possibilities for movement in there. Yeah. Ooh, there's a Buddhist understanding of deep time, and I study with Joanna Macy, who talks a lot about this, and where we have a linear picture of time, they have an understanding that now is a point, and the past and the future circle around it. And the more precisely you can get into the present moment, the more effectively you can touch the past and the future. So the ritual action of getting in a really clear ritual space, and absolutely present, that's when the past and future become available. When we're not present, the past and future are not so available. So this worldview also talks about a non-linear causal pattern. In Western culture, it's kind of billiard ball. This hits this, hits that, causes that. And we can repeat it, and it can be calculated. It's a very different pattern of causality. So you think about how a school of fish turns. They don't turn because this fish saw that one turn. They turn too fast for that. There's something else happening. Or it happens even on a basketball team. Right? People don't look around because the person calls them. They look around because somehow they know. There's some other different causality. And sometimes in this circular causality and nonlinear time, things happen before you need them. So I studied with a another African shaman, a Zimbabwean man named Bandaza Kandemwe, and he used to talk about the fact that he was an herbalist and a healer, and people would come to see him, and he always knew someone was coming because he'd have a dream about the person and the plant they needed, and then they'd show up the next day. So for him, the idea of certain plants being uh, sort of a, a recipe for certain ailments was just not even on the table. Every plant delivered itself to him for the person who was coming, and it was the plant they needed in that moment. But the plant came before the person showed up, so where's the cause in that? The other aspect is about a kind of collective consciousness, so where we have sort of have a hierarchy, where we have electrons and protons and atoms and cells and organs and organ systems and organisms, we get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, we kind of stop at this level and say that's, that's the operative unit. But it's not any more than a kidney saying, that's me, I'm the kidney, I've got, the, I've got it all figured out. <laughs> you know, the kidney only works because it's connected to everything else. We only work because we're connected to everything else. So it takes a more holistic view and says, oh, we're actually part of families and communities and neighborhoods and species and it goes up and up and up and up, and that we can operate from any of those levels. And so in the Healers Council, we're really interested in exploring what happens if we try and operate from that next level up as a single unit that is made up of a number of individuals. And it's learning, it's not exactly the word think, but it's kind of learning to think at that level, learning to learn and see and experience as a collective, not as individuals. And these, this perspective is really non-dual. It says Western culture has a very, it's black or it's white. It's yes or it's no. It helped us build computers, binary, on, off, on, off. There's lots of things that that gives us. But it doesn't have a lot of space for paradox or things being both good and bad at the same time. And I see that a lot in my work. And Joan Halifax, who's a a big teacher in the world of death and dying calls death a blessed catastrophe. 
So it's, it's awful, but it's good. Right? So that, that doesn't fit so well in a dualistic model. And so in a non-dual model, all the things that are seemingly opposite are actually in relationship. Me and you, he, here and there, now and then, good and bad, friend and enemy, all of those, we can't put things in, in clear categorizations. They live in a kind of yin-yang interrelationship with each other. So if we, if we look from that worldview, which is what we're doing in the Healer's Council, we can talk about worldviews and we can talk about worlds. So one perspective is to say there's an objective world and depending on what lens you look through, either you see different things, or you see the same things in different ways, or you see different things. The other perspective is to say the world actually is different depending on how you engage with it. And that is the one that I think is much more interesting. And we can think about the observer effect in physics, where depending on how you choose to measure a quantum phenomena, it's either a particle or a wave. But it's neither until you choose. So somewhere our consciousness and our intention and awareness actually changes the quote-unquote objective external reality. And so for this, I really look a lot to a writer named Vine Deloria Jr., who died in 2005. And he um, is uh, from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. He's Sioux from the Standing Rock Tribe. And he grew up in a long line of uh, Lutheran ministers, native, native men who were Lutheran ministers. He planned to become a minister, went to theological school, left that, became a professor of political science and a professor of law. Really interesting, he's written 20 books, really involved in the American Indian movement and activism. And so researched indigenous and First Nations history in the US for many, many, many years. And he wrote a book called The World We Used to Live In. And it was one of the last books he wrote. And for 50 years, as he was doing his research, he would come across the primary accounts of trappers and traders and explorers who had come and interacted with the native people and written up stories about what had happened. And so they'd write up a long piece, and a little part of that would be some description of an activity or a phenomena that seemed quote unquote unreal. And it was just, it was usually just a tiny bit, and it was sort of just a description, and then, then it went away. It was something else continued. So for 50 years, he saved all of those. And he said, instead of looking at them from a Western lens, what happens if we look at them as the truth, actually seeing them from that perspective? And so this book is incredible because it, it describes all of these experiences and phenomena and activities. And when you see them all together, they start to make a pattern. When it's just a little section in a bigger document, it doesn't make a pattern. But 50 years of collecting them makes a pattern. And he really argues that it needs to be read on its own terms. And when you do that, and he makes a beautiful argument for it, it's incredible the experiences people have. And for regular people, those are connections in dreams. So a hunter might be visited in dream by an elk who says, this is the ritual you need to do before you hunt, and this is the tool you need to make, and if you do this, you'll be a successful elk hunter. And it's a, it's a kind of call and response. So the dream speaks, and then you do the ritual, and then the elk come. And there are many, many examples like this of just daily engaging with a living world through dreams, through visions, through um, consciously altered states of consciousness, sweat lodge and vision fasts that change our perception and allow us to be more connected. And there, I think it's just so important that we, we shed any sort of colonial mentality as we look at them and register that these went on for hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of years. These were not stupid people. They wouldn't have done this if it didn't work. It worked. And it worked and they did it again and they did it again and they got better and better and better at it. There's something there. And so he talks about what's happening for sort of just the regular people in the community. And then he talks more particularly about what the shamans and the medicine men did, which was a whole other level of incredible conversation that you know, the capacity to shapeshift and become an animal, the capacity to 
um, develop relationships with stones where those stones could actually travel on your behalf. The horse was lost, they sent the stone. The horse came back with the stone. I mean, how, how do we hold that in Western culture? But it happens. Right? That there's a, you know, I was reading one this morning just thinking about this, uh, a tradition of, in one tribe, of wearing a raven's skin on the back of your head in battle. And if you were in a moment of danger, the raven would tap on your shoulder and tell you where you needed to look. It just was a normal, it was like, I don't know, we wear our seatbelt when we drive our car. You wouldn't go into battle without your raven skin to tap on your shoulder. So it's, it's an amazing set of anecdotes, but what's amazing, and the title of the book is The World We Used to Live In, that the world was actually different, that our engagement with it influences the world. That it's not just this objective reality that exists independent of us. That we are, in a very real sense, co-creators with the ultimate powers of the universe. Because in striving to fulfill our own destiny, we make changes that help the spiritual ideas become incarnate. So that the spirit world needs us to do what we do in order for it to do what it does. That the universe does not appear until we look for it. And I love that because it says that humans have a role in evolution. We have a role on this planet. You know, the statement that says, oh, we're messing things up, we should just all disappear. No, nature doesn't make mistakes. We're here for a reason. We actually might need to learn what our reason is and get more responsible about doing it. But that in a way, questions generate the answers. That the and you could think about like that the teacher is created by the students, that these phenomena are, appear because they are asked. And the image I love is that when a woman is breastfeeding, if her baby cries, her milk lets down. Right? There's, a, there's a relationship. Those things are in pattern. And the, where I go with that is, is the rain somehow a response to our thirst? Can you take that image and take it to another level? Are we, in how we engage, part of that process? So that the, the other the human people need to be seen and received in order to exist. And it's not, we don't want to stretch that too far and say that the human gaze creates everything, but we're members of this. And we, by how we do things, we influence who is and who isn't. There's a great quote from um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez in 100 Years of Solitude. There's a gypsy. And he says, things have a life of their own. It's just a matter of waking up their souls. So sometimes they just need to be woken up or kept alive. So this, this idea that we, the lens we bring and the, the, it's not just the lens, but the, the whole life way we exist with actually does create the world beyond us. And that it, it makes possible things and makes things impossible. So we know that how we're held by the people in our world changes who we are. We blossom if we're seen and loved, and we shrink if we're not. So why wouldn't that be true for other people? So then, back to our final question then, how does this relate to the Healers' Council? What are we doing there? And the question, if this is the world, what's learning? What's healing? How do we approach those, and how do we learn about healing? if this is the world. So taking that frame of wholeness and holy and healing, that it's about when things come together, we're in the council, we're practicing living in that new lens, code switching all the way over and giving ourselves focused time in a group that's focused that way to really deepen in that space and see what happens if we can learn to meet the world on its own terms if it is a world full of other people, and that it's creating a new story, a new map, a new, a new set of operating principles, and what, what then becomes possible. So we're curious about healing, but we're also curious about learning how to heal. And so what are the, what are the practices that then allow us to learn in that space? And I'll do some other lectures of these about some of those. You know, we're working with stones, we're working with dreams, we're working with consciousness practices that allow us to connect and open 
in different ways. And it's, it's pretty exciting. These, in a way, they're kind of research methods. How do, we, how do we use these to learn what we need to learn to become who we need to become? And that it's not about becoming it as an individual, it's about becoming it as a collective. And not doing, but being. So I'll close with a little gem from Joanna Macy, a Buddhist teacher and a deep ecologist. And she talks about healing and the, the healing that's needed for what she calls the great turning. We as a society are moving in a certain direction. And if we don't turn, we're going to get where we're going. And it's not going to be good. We need to actually turn. We need a revolution that's as big as the industrial revolution was, the agricultural revolution, the digital revolution. We need the next revolution. We need the ecological revolution. She says there are three aspects of that. There's stopping the damage. So just saving what is. Species, languages, knowledge, habitat. We just have to preserve what there is so we don't lose anymore. Slowing down the damage. The second is analysis of structural causes and creation of alternatives. So we need to build new ways of doing things. Permaculture, healers councils, the list is long about these new patterns we need to build. But the third is we need to create a new consciousness because these new little patterns, these little sprouts won't grow in the Western mind. It just doesn't nurture them. We need to create a new consciousness so that that transforming our story is as huge a part of healing and changing and the great turning as any of those other practices. And so for me, that's one of the really exciting parts about the Healers Council is exploring what it really is to transform our story. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank